Hey everybody, it's Joe Solari and Craig Martell. How you doing, Craig? <laughs> <laughs> doing great, man. Doing the, great. The, the pensive thinker over there. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. If you're not thinking, you're wasting time. So it's been a while since we've been on. Um, uh, la my wife reorganized the office, and uh, I don't know if you noticed that. Um, I, I did. Yep. And um, you moved to Hawaii. <laughs> that's a, I, I have, uh, I have, uh, <clears throat> it, it's, it's, if you look on a map, Hawaii is right next to Alaska anyway, it's just, just south of New Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> right now we've got 24 hours of daylight to, and we will for the next 67 days. So 60, uh, 70 straight days of daylight, uh, throughout the summer. And mm. so I got up at three and it was daylight. I, I, uh, woke up at midnight. It was daylight. I took the dog for a walk at four 30. It was daylight. It just it's just how it is now. So I've got the curtain behind me to block the sun because it's that this angle is to the north. Mm. And uh this angle is to the north. And so the sun makes a loop de loop in the sky behind me in the winter. Uh so the sun rises in the east, sets in the west. Uh, not not up here it doesn't. It 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 just stays in the north and in the winter it uh is in the south. It uh, kind of comes up along the southern horizon, trails along, and then jumps down. So uh, it, it, it rises in the east, sets in the west for a couple months in the spring uh, and a couple months in the fall. And six months of winter, it doesn't do that. And uh, same thing in the summer. Fun stuff. This is when everyone starts to go crazy up there, right? <clears throat> the winter is when people go crazy. Because right now, they're trying to do everything to get oh. ready for the winter. So uh, it's, uh, June is coming up. June is uh, fishing season. Mm -hmm. So uh, people will be uh, stocking their uh, stocking their fish for the year, uh, and if you have dogs, you'll go out fishing. You need to catch one fish per dog per day of winter. So if you have an eight dog, twelve dog team, you need oh, twelve yeah. fish per day times six months. Mm -hmm. So that's it, these are significant efforts. So mm -hmm. in June, uh, the the folks who are subsistence will be out there fishing every single day, eighteen twenty hours to stock the fish so they can mm -hmm. uh, survive the winter. And mm -hmm. then uh, in August, it's berry picking. So you go out and you pick uh, the blueberries or, or any other berries you might find to stock that. <clears throat> it's, it's a lot of, and growing season, because 24 hours of daylight, in the, in the 90 days, you can grow a lot of stuff because it grows <laughs> all, all day, yeah. Never thought about that. Well, you know, uh, I thought, since it's been a while since you and I have been on, we would um, hit on a couple topics. First being, um, you know, we started off the year with, a, you know, talking about plans for 2019, what you were thinking about doing. It's always a good thing to do when you set a plan is to revisit it and see how things go. So I thought we would do that. Um, you know, I, uh, sometimes I, with clients that I've worked with, um, they think the plan is like, immutable and it's like well it didn't go exactly to plan it's like well no the plan is to help us see when things mm -hmm. are going away from the information we have and when you know now do we have new information that makes mm -hmm. us change the plan like were we not you know just didn't know certain <clears throat> things now we've tried to test the waters we know the temperature do we you know what do we do next so i thought we'd talk a little bit about that and then um you know follow up with a little bit about kind of, you know, some of the conferences that are coming up and books coming out and things that might help someone. Okay. So yeah, talking about, talking about planning and adjusting, uh, I always use a military perspective because I, uh, <clears throat> that's where I come from. You, you adjust, you adjust on the fly, but in order to, for your plan to be adjustable, to help support you, you need that logistics in place. You need all of that infrastructure. And then how do you adjust to support any deviations uh, as you go? Because something's not successful, it's okay to, to peel that off and exploit success. That's a, a, a Marine Corps term. You exploit success. So whatever's working, you do more of that. And whatever's not working, you do less of that. But uh, your infrastructure that you put into place, and this is one of the things that we did from, uh, uh, to this year when I last talked to Joe, I think I was talking about publishing a book a week for, for mm -hmm. this year. Yeah. And uh, that, that started in December. It is now May 23rd. And I have published more than a book a week on average uh, since 
the middle of December. So I have uh, uh, over 30 titles published since the middle of December. Yeah, I wrote four of them, four, maybe five. <clears throat> you lose track because it's a, it's a, it's a pipeline. It's a production facility that uh, it's the factory of Craig's head that uh, is trying to keep track and, and flow through. However, the, the foundation, that, that concrete rebar reinforced foundation of uh, editing capability, of, of covers, four or five different cover artists, uh, and proofreaders, and everything to support, whether it's one book or, or 40 books, <clears throat> it's all in place. Now, scalability, we're tapering it down because uh, what we found and this is as we're going into uh, the plan, is sales have remained static. Sales have remained static, uh, even, even with the increase in titles. And that's, that was not the plan. The plan was increasing sales by expanding mm -hmm. readership. <clears throat> and what we found is pretty much the same sales. We picked up some new readers, lost some old readers, and stayed the same. So why am I uh, going through all this effort to stay the same when – fewer titles earning more or more titles earning less. But as you expand IP, intellectual property, more titles are good because it gives you a, a greater opportunity to uh, solicit with Hollywood. <clears throat> and as you get bigger, your connections get bigger and greater and you end up talking to the right people at the right time. And those conversations, it helps when you have IP that's uh, uh, 20 different sets of intellectual property based on series and, and things like that that are published. So mm -hmm. now you've got that record and, and you've got the copyright and you've got the, uh, the ownership and, and maybe even trademark on, on certain properties. <clears throat> but uh, that's, that's how we did the plan. Uh, the plan executed perfectly. It didn't deliver the result that we had, had uh, wanted. So we're adjusting, but we still have that foundation and that is great to, uh, uh, everybody has uh, has won in that regard, because uh, I mean, look at how many people we've supported through this uh, through this effort, mm. this six months. Oh my God! I mean, do, uh, you publish you, thirty books. Do you think you ha um, have any insight into some of the things that may have um, you may have not have been aware of or have changed since you put that plan in that may have made <clears throat> it harder for that sales growth? Uh, everything everything always changes and <clears throat> it's it's a little bit harder to find the readership now to expand but one thing that publishing that frequently did was it took my time away from engagement with the core readership mm -hmm. and that's one thing i'm trying to get back to is the fans never let a real fan get dis disappointed because you didn't answer their email you didn't uh, answer their message or you didn't even like their their comment on your post. Uh, things like that uh, go a long ways. You keep that core readership, you hold them close, and and you help expand that core readership because this group, hey, I, I've talked to my favorite author, uh, e even if it's me, which is which is really bizarre, but still, it's, uh, it, it's something that you don't want to, don't ever take it lightly. And I didn't, I just didn't, I ran out of time trying to expand the IP. So, getting back mm. to that. So I've, I have uh, the last couple months, I've actually drawn back pretty significantly. So the, the trails are petering out on these, uh, this book a month. And it's like three more weeks, then we hit a hard stop. And I don't have any more books. Uh, I have two more in the pipeline, but uh, it's not going to be a week. It's going to be back down to one a month. And then, and then I'm shooting for actually one Craig Martell book a quarter. Mm. Is, uh, is what I'm going to drop back to. But I have that core readership and, and managing them, managing, it, uh, probably the wrong term. It's what it is, is, is embracing them yeah, and, and having, a cook, having a cookout and giving them, giving them some of my time and, and talking about uh, the sun doing loop-de-loops in the northern sky and things like that. that uh, and, then, and then floating, hey, here's a paragraph. What do you think of this? What does this mean to you? Uh, as I as I work more on my my prose, just trying to get better with every every new word, mm -hmm. so <clears throat> that re don't ever ever lose sight. And I didn't. I just uh, didn't give them as much time as they've deserved. Mm. No, I, that's that's understandable. I, you know, I was um, talking to um, Chris Kennedy the other day, and he spends a lot of time on the road at conventions. Right, but that's. Yeah the reason he does that is because he's face to face with fans and 
you know, that's why there's people that are at his conventions that are cosplaying his characters, right? Yeah. Like, yep. Um, yep. Because he's there cosplaying with them, right? That, that's, that's his thing. Right. And it work. it's hard. Like it, that's a different type of hard, right? Because, Oh my he, God. Yes. <laughs> but, um, you know, that kind of, um, commitment to the, to the brand is, is, uh, seen by fans is, you know, genuine because it is, and, and yeah. they want, they respect that. Right. Yeah. Um, yep. And, and visibility, you look at uh, Kevin J. Anderson. I think he had 20 shows this year that he's doing. Yeah, yeah. Some of these guys are—they're um, sled dogs, right? They're—they're they're out there on the road a lot, and um, yeah. um, you, you don't—you know—it's hard to see because you know you don't know how many of those people buy that book at that con and then go read the whole series, right? Like, there's there's a whole read-through piece there that probably could be explored further, but. Um, <clears throat> More so is I think that people get, you know, as authors, you like, I'm just a normal guy, but like for your fans, you're, you're not, you're not, that's, uh, th there comes a point when you have to accept that, that you're not, but I mean, don't ever lose, uh, uh, lose touch with who you really are, mm -hmm. but there's a point where, uh, I mean, I have people, Oh, I'm fangirling and, and, uh, it's like, yeah, I'm just me. I, yeah. I've never been anybody other than me. Mm. It's just now, you know, who I am. And I know who you are, uh, yeah. so we shake hands, and 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 it's nice. But that's uh, I I uh, getting out of Alaska is so so problematic and expensive and time consuming mm -hmm. that uh, I I focus more on when I have my time is writing and and creating intellectual property is is uh, telling the stories, and I can't do that on the road as good as I can do it here. Mm, yeah, yeah. So you know I know. Um, from folks I've talked to probably one of the biggest things that um, threw them off in the last few months has been all the changes on Amazon with advertising. Mm -hmm. um, it's something I've talked about, like this shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't be surprised because if you, if you think of Amazon as a, a partner um, and you're doing business with them, you should be listening to what your partner's strategies are, which they have to tell people quarterly <laughs> or they go to jail um, because they're publicly traded. So, you know, the, the changes in advertising and the focus on advertising shouldn't really be a surprise to anyone because they've been talking about it now for over a year. But to oh, that point, like how have you been, how have you been with that information been thinking about? We've adjusted the ads. We've adjusted our, our targeting. We've adjusted how we approach the ads. Uh, using various uh, techniques and and opportunities available to Amazon, uh, like the advertiser uh, uh, approach, where you pay that that monthly fee. Mm -hmm. uh, we've tried that. We've tried different uh, uh, approaches. The top level bar. What's it take to get that? Uh, putting the pictures in your your blurb. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen some advertisers do that. And, and what we, the conclusion we came to on that is that it, it didn't pay off. There, there was no additional sales because of making it look like with, uh, with graphics and uh, different text and, mm -hmm. and making it a super wow blurb because I think most significantly that's below the fold. Yeah. <clears throat> and if somebody has to click read more to get into your story and then you give them a lot more to read, they're not necessarily going to read that. Yes, there are pictures in there, but, the big thing is you got to, if you can sell them on those first five sentences that you get and the cover and the, the good title, the title is almost as important as, uh, as your cover and your blurb. And, and I know that I've had some bad titles and I've had some incredible titles and guess what? The incredible titles, which maybe is a surprise because I'm thinking as the artist writing the book, but if you're thinking as a marketer, Title your books as a marketer, not uh, not the artist who wrote the damn thing, mm. because that doesn't it, the two don't necessarily match up. <clears throat> um, and uh, uh, that title will help sell the book every bit as much as uh, uh, as your cover and your blurb and your subtitle. The uh, <clears throat> the current trend on subtitles is you tell it what it is. This is an urban fantasy dragon magic uh, dark fantasy. Yeah, <clears throat> whatever mashup it is. Because 
that improves the reader experience. And if you read anything from Amazon, you'll find they're always talking about the reader experience or the customer experience. Mm -hmm. So if you confuse them with, this is not erotica, read about the intimate details of what? Is it or isn't it? I mean, you, you, have to, you have to be clear. And if you confuse a reader and you make them angry, saying this is, this is a clean romance and the first five pages are, are a massive sex scene, guess what? The readers are going to complain. Mm. And, it, and when the readers are complaining about your stuff and it's valid because you've misled them, you're going to have problems. Uh, as in, you, you can't advertise, as in uh, you get quality notices and, and things like things that you want to avoid. <laughs> so the, the managing the reader experience, and this is, goes back to everything. Uh, and my book coming out, Release Strategies, coming out, should be next week. Um, I talk about managing reader expectations, whether it's one book a year or, or one book a month. How, mm -hmm. do you, how do you let them know? And I, I continuously use the terms uh, uh, under-promise and over-deliver. So don't ever say, I'll give you a book a month, and then three months later, you haven't given them the second book. They're going to leave. And, mm. and uh, uh, finding them a second time is really, really hard and, and going to be really expensive, whether yeah. in time or, or money. So I, we're talking about planning. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> to, just on that point, like on that brand promise, we'll get back yeah. to planning in a second. It's like, I mean, a lot of people are like, well, it's Craig. He's got all these books and stuff. But like that is so important when you're beginning too. like mm -hmm. um, when I talk to startup authors who come to me and they're like, well, what should I do about my business? And, how, what, and like they're <clears throat> genuinely wanting to make sure that they're starting off on the right foot. And should they have a company or should they do this? And it's, I've always, I always say is like money needs to go into the product and you need to plan your product in a way that is in alignment with the genre you're writing. So if you're writing in a genre that has an expectation of a series and a minimum set of three books and your plan is I'm going to write book one and that is going to make the money that funds book two and three. Like your, your, your plan, you failed before you started, right? The plan is flawed yeah. because, yeah. It, and it's because you're not meeting that brand promise, right? Because you're going into a, a place where when readers fly by that page and they see book one and no book two and three, they're done. Yeah. They know <clears throat> they've been disappointed, right? Like there's a lot of book ones floating out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, that they and, loved and they're pissed because it's like there's no resolution and, and if you want to go uh, find books in the one million rankings uh, that'll be your book ones with no book twos so <laughs> that's yeah. uh, that's not what you want no so that that means okay now um what do i have to do well i have to get a lot of it is your own personal expectations about what's going to happen that you're not going to be where you think you are in in in, a, in in this time frame, there's going to have to be some patience. And that means, okay, you know, save the money, get the three covers made, have the money set aside to get all three books edited, get, you know, you, you can shorten that timeline by maybe having book one in the box, book two with the editor and you're getting number three, but like, you know, you know, you have to have all that and the underlying capital there to do it because the fastest writer in the world, if you can't pay for your covers, you're not publishing. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And that's uh, stockpiling. It, how much do you stockpile? And, and you can write the books. You don't have to pay a penny to write the books. So having book one done, having book two done, and then starting your search for an editor as, you, as you've socked away $10 mm -hmm. a month or whatever it is, uh, uh, however you get it edited, whether it's through a group of friends and you murder board your, your book. And I've seen that and it works just fine. So it, you don't have to pay a whole lot in order to get out there the first time. But if you, once you uh, uh, establish your process, then you need to then start put that foundation into place for a professional production and professional just simply means you manage the aspects of the production. If you murder board your, your book uh, for editing every time, that, that's fine if that's your process, but also understand that takes time. So you can do all this and then you sock away money, you get some covers, uh, and then you, uh, if you have books one and two done, then you can put 
book two and three on pre-order, and then when they go and see that only book one's available, but the other two are on pre-order, that's, that's kind of a promise that, mm. that's why Amazon is very heavy handed on if you miss your pre-order, you lose pre-order privileges for a year because mm. they're making a promise to the reader and reader expectations. It's, it's the uh, uh, customer experience. Yeah. You make for a bad customer experience, you're going to get punished because they don't want you to do that. They want you to have a good customer experience. <clears throat> Here's the three books. And I've, I see a lot of those too, where book one is out and a lot of advertising is going against it. And then book two and three are both on, both on pre-order. Mm -hmm, for sure. The promise. Yeah, it's, it's key. So yeah, we were on planning. Um, based on, uh, you know, you mentioned a little bit of how you kind of reevaluate things kind of with your military experience, but um, based on that, like what has changed, right? You, 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 you mentioned one thing being you're starting to shift to. The one thing that uh, uh, we finally put together, here's the KENP rates for, for the year, for every month. And so I made it sortable so you can sort by, hey, what, do, what does the historical of August and click and see the, the three Augusts. Mm -hmm. And then uh, check uh, September. What are the three Septembers? And and we see consistently that uh, October, it, it starts to go up. November, it's uh, high. Uh, December, it's high. And, and it takes a nose, nose dive for January page reads. Now, January sales are easier, but that's, uh, okay, hey, you, if you're going to go against uh, competition, then how do you do that where you can maximize your your potential? With a core readership, if I'm going to get a million page reads in a month or, or three to five million, how can I get the most from that? Well, then I want to release in October, November, and December. So what I'm doing is, is wickering that way. And my plan is a backward plan. If I want to release a heavy hitter book in October and another one in maybe November and December, what do I need to do three months ago to get that? And that's what I did last year. You see that uh, in November during the conference, I had this huge dip in my ranking, and it was because I started in July stockpiling and building. So my cash flow from July through November took a big dip because I had such outlays for uh, work for hire and some other stuff, uh, getting the covers done, uh, buying an eight-pack set of covers and, and things like that for long series, and did all that. And then come December, we started releasing. I had, geez, I had five books with another 15 almost finished when we started. Mm -hmm. You don't publish a book a week uh, not having them ready. So we had this huge stockpile that we kept feeding. It's like a bagpipe. We kept blowing air into the big bag and squeezing some out and more air in and squeezing some out. Yeah. And, and it's, it's a, a time-consuming and, uh, and uh, stressful process, especially as we went on because we missed uh, – we missed a couple deadlines, but that was after the initial, we hit the initial three or four in the, in the short time frame, mm -hmm. And, uh, it's just, uh, getting those next books. It's, uh, it, it was, it was a challenge, but what we're doing is, and what I've done from the outset was backward plan. Mm -hmm. uh, so I pick, if I want to release in December, I want to release in December and I want a long book because K E N P. So I'm going to do a long book release in October and another one in December. And those were shooting for 120K, 120K words. Mm. Uh, so, but those are underway now because <laughs> they're not going to magically appear. Oh, geez, it's October 1st. I got to get a book done to this yeah. one. I, I, I don't have the capability to do that anymore. I'm, I am way too busy with other stuff. Um, so do you, what kind of like systems are you using to kind of keep people like, because it's not just you and. Phil is doing this. There's, there's a team that has to know what's up and when they are, they have to deliver. How are That's you a, are you doing that? The management hat. I, uh, I, I have to say that I uh, do most of it in my head. I have spreadsheets though, uh, that I use. Here's what I, here's what I need and, and backward plan on those, but those are just entries. There's nothing that pops up and says this cover is due this date. Uh, uh, what I do and what I, when I'm, uh, uh, capable of doing because of uh, of a good uh, uh, war chest of cash is I'll just buy all the covers at one time. And unfortunately, a couple series, they ended before uh, we used all eight or 12 mm -hmm. covers. So I yeah. ate some of the covers and, and that's okay. That's okay for me. If you're tight on cash, you want to control your cash flow. It's still, 
you're going to get a better deal buying all your covers, but that's, you've got to be firm that you're going to get these books written. Don't, mm -hmm. don't waste money buying covers you don't need. So know what you need, but get them as early in the process as possible. Yeah. And I, um, just from some of the clients that I've been working with is the, especially with the uncertainty of like, maybe I'm going to have to spend more on advertising or just, you really have to be watching that cash flow and looking down the pipe because um, especially for authors, the pain you're kind of, you're, you're getting some indicators of there being an issue in your sales numbers, but the actual cash flow pain is coming in 60 days. The, 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 the real pain <clears throat> I've got my, uh, I've got my Facebook ads limit set at $900. And, and those have become, have been coming with a, a little more frequency than I liked. <laughs> so I, I see one pop up. Hey, we recharge, we charged your, uh, your Facebook ads. I'm like, Oh my God, didn't that just happen last week? Yeah. And, and, uh, it's like, Holy cow. And you're looking at sales and on, on a few ads, I spent uh, $750 on an ad that only earned about a hundred dollars. <throat> and, uh, waiting for read through though. It's like, is it earning or not? And I pulled the plug at seven fifty for a hundred. I let it run at seven fifty for three fifty because then it was, it was just on a book one in a nine book set. And I'm like, I'm confident that we're going to get that read through over time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, cause you look at uh, what is the value of one book uh, if they buy it at uh, and, and they're buying it at full price. So I, I have a much higher chance of getting read through to book two because they bought into mm -hmm. at a $5 price. They bought into a, a, a book one. So uh, uh, even with that though, at seven fifty for a hundred dollar return, I'm like, yeah, it's not, that's not cutting it. I, I'm not going to do that. So I drew mm -hmm. those back. I'm, I'm only spending about a one one fifty on that set now. And, and it tell, I can tell that book one, isn't selling at all right now. It took a big nosedive when we, when we cranked that back. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So hey, it's okay. We'll re-record the ads and run some new ones. Well, and I think that's authors have to understand that um, their margins aren't what they used to be. Right. Like you have to be, you have to be willing to accept a uh, 150%. So you spend 10,000 to get 15,000. Well, and just from, you know, a business cash flow perspective is like, you know, if you are thinking that you're making 70% margin on the book you sold, you're not, right? Like the, there's... No, no. You know, it, and nobody I've gets 70%. It, you click the box, it says 70%, but that delivery fee will guarantee that you don't get a full 70%. Sure, sure. But what I'm seeing from folks I'm working with is, is that their margins are when you, when you bake in advertising and this is an average, right? Some folks don't, yeah. some are really heavy on advertising depending on their genre, but really the average margin is probably closer to 35. Okay. Um, that's just been kind of my insight from behind the curtain. So it's like, if you're not thinking about your business that way, then you're going to get jammed up with cash flow, right? Because <clears throat> exactly. You, you need, you need a bigger war chest. And if you've got, and 35%, Think about how many businesses out there would love to have a 35 Right, that's great. Margin. Still, it's still great margin, right? But, but you, it, to scale up, to scale up, if you're spending $1,000 and making thirteen fifty, and you, you traditionally spend $1,000, now, the way that works on a cash flow perspective is you only need $3,000 to spend 1000 and you rotate that over because you're getting that back in 60 days. Mm -hmm. So you get that back, you rotate that thousand and you get 350 to set aside. Yeah. So it's, it's okay once you get over that hurdle. But if you want to ramp up from a thousand to 10,000 spend to get 3,500 per month, where's that other 7,000 come from to, to roll in? And that's what people are having a, having a problem with. You have people with a, with a good cash flow. Those are the ones who are starting to separate themselves and move forward mm -hmm. because they have that extra cash to, to scale up and pay now to get $3,500 later. Yeah. Yeah. And, and my, my concern for some folks is, is that um, it's also that duration, right? Like the, there are some authors that are really committed to this that, you know, working hard to make it happen. It's like, you have to be in a position where 
you can be without that thousand bucks for that 60 days. Yes, it's going to come oh, back yeah. as 1350, but have you thought through what your family life is going to be without a thousand dollars for the next 60 days? Because for, I know in my case, there's times where a thousand dollars not in the family budget for two months means some pretty dire stuff, right? Yeah. Um, yep. Now, yep. once you kind of scale it up, then it's like, well, that's just the working capital in the business and you're really not thinking of it. But in the early stages, when you oh, yeah. started, like really think that through, not just on for what's <clears throat> the business, but like. Well, and that's, that's where you, ha that's what I call the readership building stage. This is where you gain your fans through newsletter swaps, through engagement online, through different methods of getting readers without spending a whole lot of money. Mm. And that's where. I, I talked earlier about uh, making sure you, you manage your reader expectations. You, you treat them like family and friends and, and help them build that core foundation. Because if uh, once you have that, now maybe you sell $1,500, $2,000 worth of books just out of your core readership and spend nothing to get that. And now if you're spending 1000 to get an additional $350, you've actually pulled in a couple thousand dollars and that's where you need to focus, especially for newer authors who are, who are trying to figure out advertising. Mm -hmm. So you've got to build your readership. And that's, this is one thing I harp on in release strategies is uh, rapid release will not help you if you have no readers. So it's not like, Hey, I'm just going to release three books and Amazon is going to love me and they're going to sell my book and uh, I, I'm going to make all kinds of money. Possibly, but that's one in a million. So if you want to if you want to have odds better than the lottery, you need to build a leadership first. Mm. And, this is a, and, and I go into some various methods, but that's that would make the book too long. There are all different kinds of ways. I put uh, uh, Nick Stevenson's book up on uh, Twenty Books. That uh, Reader Magnet is what it's called, mm -hmm. and it's free. He, he's got it as perma free. So go grab it. Mm. It's free, and and take a look. Yeah, and you know um, we've had. Um CJ from Art of the Arctane on here before. He's got a um, a newsletter swap deal that's it's free, right? Like it, there's there's no cost. You can buy a premium spot if you want, which is I think twenty bucks. But like there are ways to do that, and I know for a fact because of what I've done with my fiction pen name, there are names that have come from like things like that list and other list swaps that I've done, which would be like free readers that I know because I look at my list this close, spent over $20 with me on a Kickstarter, right? So it's, they became fans, they followed the books, they bought the books, and now I found some other places where they're prepared to pay even more money. But it's that kind of, you gotta look at that stuff and understand it. You can't, it's not a numbers game. And I think that's kind of what we're both saying is like getting more to understand your fans on a qualitative basis. Gets yeah, so I, I think it's both. Yeah. I think there's a numbers element to it. <clears throat> uh, uh, talking with Mark Dawson, he had uh, he dropped one of his books on sale and sent out, and the only thing he did was send it to his list, mm -hmm. saying, "Oh, by the way, if you don't have this book, it's ninety nine cents this uh, today and tomorrow, something like that." And the, he sold thirteen hundred and fifty copies of that book. Only sending one email to his list. Now his list is a hundred thousand people. Yeah, but that's but something like that. If you if you nurture it and and maintain it, you can get that that little bump, that uh, nice exposure, a quick uh, a quick injection of some cash, uh, and uh, it's it's maintaining those readers. So a hundred thousand lists because you look at it, it's a one point three five percent sales rate. Okay, that's not that's that's okay. That, that I mean. It's not, it's not eye popping, mm -mm. but it's, it's, it, if a 1.35 and you only had a thousand, well, that's not very much. That's 14 copies. So it's, yeah, uh, there's yeah. a certain element to the numbers, but your core readership, these are the folks that you really want to hold close, nurture as you do. Cause your, your list, you manage differently depending on what they do. Yeah, because they go into different buckets and uh, mm -hmm. and have a different qualitative factor assigned to them, and uh, you treat them appropriately. I mean, if nobody ever responds to your stuff like me, then uh, you, get, <laughs> you get you get run through the dishwasher cycle and say, "Do you really want to be here? You suck." <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, but you know, I always say this is like you don't know if there's somebody on your list that may own their own private jet. That's right. That's right. right. Like, they may they they're and if you I think authors are just like, well, everyone doesn't want to they don't have any money to spend and they only want ninety nine cent books. Like, no, no. Like um a big eye opener for me when I did that Kickstarter was I could then see with Kickstarter data, like there were people that were on my list that are my fans that spend thousands of dollars a year on Kickstarter. Okay. Now then it's not to say I'm going to get that money, but it's like, okay, now I know a little bit more about these guys. Like they've got money to spend. They've, you know, mm -hmm. what's important to them. Then I can use that with my intellectual property if I want. Right. Then I yeah. can start to think about some different ways how maybe my intellectual <clears throat> property could capture more money. Or well, like, like we were talking before we went live, your Kickstarter was to take your book and turn it into an audiobook. Mm -hmm. And and what you find is somebody willing to pay ninety nine cents for an audio or a, a paperback or not a paperback but an ebook, they may be willing to spend twenty five on an audiobook. It's not that it's the investment of ninety nine cents for for an ebook is based on they probably won't get to read it because they don't have time. Mm -hmm. They're perfectly willing to pay twenty five book bucks for an audiobook because they know they'll be able to work that into their into their process because they're stuck in traffic in goddamn Chicago. Why would you live there? <laughs> so you're stuck in traffic for two hours to yeah. drive three miles to Piggly Wiggly, and uh, and what do you do? You listen to audiobooks. Yep. Or over the road truckers. You look at them. Okay, they make good money, but a an ebook. When am I going to be able to read an ebook? Never. But and that's uh, I have some fans. It's like, geez, I, I I can't read any books. I don't have the time. And when I finally do, I'm not driving. I'm not going to read. I'll watch some TV. I'll do something that isn't just trying to uh, to focus and concentrate. Mm. I listen, get it in an audiobook, and I'll buy it. But uh, yeah, ninety nine cents. I, I won't even take it for free because I want the audiobook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was the, you know, and the other thing is kind of filtering what you hear on your newsletter, right? Like because that overwhelming response when I started like, okay, because I did a survey, like which of these narrators do you like? The yeah. Overwhelming response wasn't the choice of a narrator. It was audiobooks suck. <laughs> like, I'm serious. Like what? I mean that it was tantamount to it's dancing with the devil. And it's like, okay, well you're, you're, a, you're a avid reader and you have some like worship of the printed word. I get that. <laughs> so I, that you have to filter out, right? That's not the, yep. that's not the segment. They are not going to buy an audio book. Yep, yep. And, and it doesn't mean I'm not writing books anymore. It means like, but there was a lot of people that said, okay, this is the, um, this is the narrator I like, which by the way, wasn't the one that I liked. So I yeah. went with the one they liked. But understanding how to go find those people, uh, you know, so on that, like, I know you're hot on the presses, getting your books ready, and you've been doing a lot of work on this. Tell us about what to expect with the books that are coming out and kind of your thoughts. I know there's, you kind of redid the first one. Well, you just redid the cover or did you change any of the content? I, I, I redid about 25 covers. Uh, okay. So that cash flow again, <laughs> um, uh, a little, little spendy, but uh, when a book isn't resonating, you take a look at, is it, is it, is it the book? or is it the presentation of the book? Uh, so you have to have those married up. So we looked at the presentation of the book and said, hey, let's, let's try this. So uh, once again, if you have enough cash, then you can try different things that may have a certain price tag attached. Mm. Um, so we put new covers on Dark Landing. We put new covers on Metal Legion, that series, uh, Military Sci-Fi, and Dark Landing uh, in June. I don't know when this is going to air, hopefully today, tomorrow, something like that. But in June, Dark Landing is going to be... Uh, the first omnibus, it's free. We're using those five days and okay. and, and going to make it free. And we put new covers on them, and they are, they are kick-ass. They're really good. Uh, I saw them. They space, look good. Space Western. Yeah, it really writes the genre in, in a different way than the first sets of covers. So uh, very, very hard branded. And, and we also went with, because we touted it as an episode, so once again, know your genre, and we tried to make them consistent, but this is, uh, this is Star Trek all over again. It's the exact same cover, just with a different title and a different number in the badge saying, this is book two, this is book three, mm. it's this title, but it's the same cover. So uh, you can see that it's, it's consistency. This is, these are episodes. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the big book for, uh, for authors that are listening to this 
is uh, uh, release strategies comes out next week. Uh, I will. Uh, I, I won't tell anybody until I find uh, until the paperback is live because I want to have the paperback linked with the uh, the the ebook, and because uh, I I want to make it so the ebook is free with the yeah. if you buy the paperback. I mean that's I'm not I'm not trying to to uh, uh, to steal money from anybody. The uh, that one goes into all different kinds of release strategies, whether you're new or or have been around a while. Uh, a lot of information we've learned through hundreds of book uh, book launches, and uh, and also taking my own advice. That's why I'm going to drop drop mine back and do more intentional releases because a solid release is worth more than than volume in a certain regard. Mm-hmm. Once you have your core readership, if you have too much volume, then they need to pick and choose, and I don't want to make them pick and choose. I want them to buy it all, and the only way I can do that is through through less, but with more intentionality. Mm. Um, uh, Metal Legion. I love that series. That's going to be uh, uh, rolling through. We've got some Wuxia coming, which is a Chinese fantasy superhero kind of uh, genre. It's 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 really really huge in China, mm. uh, and and gaining traction here in the U.S. That's uh, one thing that we'll be starting within about two months. And these are big books, so these will be 120, 150 k books mm. on uh, uh, on uh, Chinese fantasy superhero uh, uh, is a way to describe it. Okay. Um, Nightwalker is a series. That's a great series. It's uh, something that, uh, and this is uh, when it goes to legacy. Uh, Frank Roderus was a Western author and he mostly wrote for other people. He ghost wrote, but he had his own books. He never did a series because he didn't know if he would have the time based on, on what he was writing at the time. So, after he passed away, they found these four books on his computer, and they were post-apocalyptic. And uh, they had uh, they had some minor, uh, a couple uh, like a plot error right up front in the first book, but some other issues. And they tried publishing a couple, and they they didn't take uh, root at all because he's a, he's a Western author. So uh, uh, we were able to pick up that license that series, mm. and I went through it. I cleaned up the uh, post-apoc issues, and then. Uh, uh, and then work some language and halfway through the fourth book, he just stopped writing because he, he died, un- unfortunately. So how do we, uh, so, so we picked that up, finished writing. I finished writing the fourth book. I have the fifth book started. So that's something that I'm going to continue as well is, is helping legacy mm. and uh, Nightwalker. So it's a post-apocalyptic written in, in Western style, like Louis L'Amour, because Frank Roders was of that era. Sure, sure. <clears throat> And it's a, so that's neat. And we are looking at more properties to do that with, mm. uh, in, in the genres that, that we embrace. Post Apoc is a, is a big one. Uh, I have one right now. It is going to be way cool. It's a sword and sorcery book. It's a big sword, like a hundred grand uh, word, hundred K word book. Uh, but it's sword and sorcery. They're like, we're having problems marketing this. We're just, we're going to pull it back and we need to, we need to, uh, uh, take a better look at it. Can we license it out? We looked at that and said, oh, my God, I love this. It's a, it's a sword and sorcery. No wonder you're having problems because they weren't marketing it as a, as a sword and sorcery. Mm-hmm. And it was written by a Western author as well. Okay. So that's a, an opportunity. So I'm going to punch that up, and we'll, uh, we'll throw that one out there too. But the, uh, my own books, uh, <clears throat> I've got uh, The Green Door of Fate on the other screen. I need to add a, a few thousand words to that today. Is a, uh, That's going to be – a book that uh, I, I completely go back through over and over again to rewrite it and keep rewriting it until I'm satisfied with it. I'm going to publish it in September as part of my uh, The Expanding Universe anthology. It'll probably be about 15,000 words, a novelette. Mm-hmm. But this is going to be me sh- uh, showing the best of my prose, shall we say, the best of the storytelling, uh, the most engaging. And, uh, I've got 5,000 words so far, and it's it's good. It's a it's a little bit different, but different in a better way, if you ask me. Uh, we'll see what my uh, my beta readers uh, say. They'll mm. probably hate it, and uh, <laughs> and then I'll argue with them, and then we'll we'll change four words, and then they'll say, oh, okay, now it's great, and so we'll uh, we'll do what we can. No, they they uh, they will argue hard. I I uh, have completely rewritten books based on what they've told me. Mm. Hey, this is a good book. Look at this style. And they're like, oh my God, this sucks so bad. I want to kill myself. 
like, no, no. All right. Let's, uh, let's rewrite it instead. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and, and I know besides all the books you're putting out conference wise, what's, what's kind of the schedule? Oh, next up, uh, Edinburgh is right around the corner. Edinburgh from July 25th to 31st uh, at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Mm-hmm. We're, uh, we're finalizing. I need to put out some stuff uh, today, tomorrow on, on that to keep the, the people coming, the attendees, uh, excited and looking forward to it. Let them know what is up. Here's exactly what's going to happen. Here's, here's how things are going to work. And uh, uh, a little writing retreat combined with uh, the conference part. So uh, I actually need to start harping on the, the uh, presenters to give me their slides. Mm. So I, I have that. And then uh, uh, the uh, Las Vegas conference is so, so big. It has become so big that uh, I hear from people, like, like big people, John Truby. Okay, everybody knows who John Truby. I didn't. Uh, I hear from him say, Hey, I, I, I want to come and I'd like to present. I'm like, yeah, okay. I hear that a lot. I didn't tell him that, but I'm like, oh yeah. Okay. And then Michael Anderley's like, oh no, John Truby, he, he's done this. Look at his screenwriting. I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, I'll put him on the screenwriting panel. And, uh, and then I hear from him after I said, hey, I'll, could you do the screenwriting panel? He's like, well, I was hoping to do a, a panel on this, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, story. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, Okay, whatever. So I look it up, and I'm like, "Oh my God!" Yeah, dude. that's John Truby. Okay, <laughs> but he might but have written like a that, book or two on that. that I mean, he 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 didn't write a he wrote the book on that. Yeah. So, oh my God! Uh, yeah, yeah. So I uh, and this is he paid his he's paying his own way to the conference, and that's mm-hmm. that's the power of the Twenty Books Vegas conference. It has grown to the part where where people want to come to 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 help out. It's the it's the single place. In, in America that they can come to give back because mm-hmm. we're not trying to make money off them coming. And so I, I, I think they all know that. And the, the horsepower that is coming to the show to share their knowledge with, uh, with everybody is, is incredible. Mm-hmm. So managing that as well as trying to, I, I mean, how about telling an author who makes roughly uh, 30, $40,000 a month, telling them, I- I'm sorry, you're not big enough to be on this panel. Uh, it's a it's it's a challenge mm. to make sure that everybody gets their chance to do to help to uh, participate. So uh, I, I'm really really struggling with the uh, the stickers for the badges because uh, I don't want uh, hey I'm the I'm the grandmaster of of the world I am uh, a million seller uh, uh, I want you to know who those people are but I don't want hey look at me signs. Mm-hmm. Uh, that people wear. Uh, I, I am uh, I am morally opposed to that. I want signs that say, "How can I help you?" Uh, for for the guests, for the guest speakers, for uh, uh, for the panelists, and and for our staff to just say, "How can I help you?" And that's uh, uh, instead of look at me. It's like, oh hey, here's somebody who can help. Can you tell me where this is? Mm-hmm. Or oh hey, you're John Truby, the, the the power of story. Let me. Uh, 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 I have a question. <clears throat> so. How, how do we identify those people? So I think we're going to have a, a limited, how can I help you tags? And that's going to be both uh, the staff, the folks who are helping uh, with the conference itself, as well as the guest speakers. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and that's, and that's it. It's not going to be, I'm a, I'm a five time uh, champion novelist for X or, or a, uh, a Bram Stoker award winner. That's huge. That's huge. But, uh, uh, uh understanding who you are at the show, that's where your name on the badge, it's going to have to carry the weight. Because uh, uh, I'd like to think that, especially a, a show like 20 Books Vegas, we're all equals. We are all looking to add that next word to the page. Uh, whether it's uh, uh, the start of our career or towards the end of our career, we're still, mm-hmm. we're writers at heart. And as a calling, I'd like to think that, that we, we want to put right. We don't want to half-ass it. And if we've been, if somebody has been way more successful than others, then they can, they're trying to leverage more of that success to, for their next book to be even better. Because, uh, you know, you know how your standard of living changes with your income mm. and, and it's hard not to rise as you go. But uh, uh, the pedestals for a group like uh, 20 books to 50 K are lower because you've got uh, people like Michael Anderley, who's uh, who's mid seven figures in their in their income, 
and what does uh, and he's willing to walk around and talk to anyone uh, about almost anything and everybody else i think that uh, is is a is a foundational difference that uh, that we bring is that we don't want to put people on pedestals we're all the same we're all authors authors first and we want everyone to embrace that as part of their their persona uh, you you'll be sitting in the audience you'll be sitting next to somebody who is multiple, multiple award winners, well-deserved with, with books that have been turned into movies, and you won't even realize it. Mm. And that's important because when you ask, oh, what was he talking about here? And then they elaborate on it, and you're like, oh, wow, that's great. Thank you. And then you find out later, oh, my God, that was Andy Ware. <laughs> well, I've had that, uh, that experience, right? Like, I mean, if you think about, like, when you had me out that first year, and I went to that, that dinner. Michael's dinner, right? And yeah, and uh, you know, there I've told this story before. I was like, this particular person's like, yeah, I made fifty thousand dollars. Like, oh, that's really great. And he's like, yeah, I think I'm gonna make about eighty thousand next month. I'm like, yeah, 50, 000, talking like, a like, month. Yeah, month. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, I did, I had no idea, right? And um, so like my my approach to everybody there is because I I'm not a huge reader, so I don't know who people are. I'm not trying to. Be yeah, no, I don't know. Like, so like yeah. I can meet somebody and they could never have written a book. I can help them with, with that. Or it can be somebody that has, you know, been traditionally published and they're trying to figure other stuff out. I can help them with different stuff. Right. Um, it's stopping. I think this is probably good for everybody is just stop and get to know the people there. Like if this is your first time at that conference, everybody's, you know, ex- I would say this, assume the person you're going to meet is more introverted than you. Mm-hmm. That's a good, a good methodology. <laughs> right. And just get talking. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people like myself and, you know, Susie's coming out again this year that we have, we try and make people like we, we like to help that network grow. Like it's like, Oh, you need to meet this person. You need to meet that person. <clears throat> if you're not there, we can't help you meet no. those people. Right. Yeah. Like that, yeah. And I think the real real magic of that conference is kind of outside of the sessions, right? It's, it's those like, absolutely think of the value that's been created in some of the collaborations that have happened at that conference. Well, not just collaborate collaborations. Yes. But also that, that one word that all you need to motivate you to look in a different place Mm. to find the information you need to change how you do things. Uh, the, the the twenty books Vegas conferences have really uh, have changed lives in way more ways than than I can encapsulate. And I, I, I am uh, I Michael and I we talk about this a lot. Uh, we were just we just spent uh, the last uh, four days in in Burbank, California, and uh, we talked about changing lives. It's it's not we never set out to do that. We never did that. It's mm-hmm. just hey, here's what I'm doing. It's different embrace being different in a way that gives you a result that you're trying to get. Don't be different just to be different. Uh, It's a, it's your difference is part of who you are. Now wrap that into a business strategy, because if you don't have any business strategy, if you just want to write a great poem or just write a great story, but then don't do anything with it, then your, your goals to, to make money from your words are different than mine. Mm. And, and, not better, not worse. I'm not saying that. It's just different. Uh, what we're trying to do is now think of it, put your different hat on, think of it as a product, and how can then you uh, you make money so you can publish a book two or a book three. Uh, the, getting those kind reviews, getting things like that, uh, uh, having strangers buy your book and then say great things about it is is really motivating. And it mm-hmm. doesn't take much of that before you you march forward and, hey, now you've got 10 books out. Or, or 20, and you realize that 50K is kind of lowballing it when, uh, when your books resonate because you write great stories. Your difference makes you tell a good story in a great way. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I, I think that's, you know, now that I've been to more of these conferences, I think that's the one thing that's, um, that is also different is there is a business focus, right? We're not, granted, that's what I come there to talk about is like, I, I I love to hear about what people are writing, but I want to I want to help people make money with their creativity, mm-hmm. right? Like it's in the end, 
Like I think of it like you, you and I were both in the oil and gas industry. Like that's a finite resource. There's only yep. so much on the planet that we have. Yep. Creativity, yep. endless supply. Endless yep. supply to convert into cold, hard cash. Yep, yep. And it's, uh, it allows us to do what we do. Uh, if, if I made no money at this, I, I, I mean, I wouldn't be running conferences. I make money at my fiction so I can run conferences because uh, it, uh, it's, it's gratifying. But also, who would I be to, to lead these conferences if I, didn't, if I wasn't successful? Mm. If every one of my books was ranked in the millions, all two of them, uh, <laughs> what credibility would I have? So this is, uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, you have to have that credibility because you look what Mark Dawson does with his self-publishing formula. And it's about, he makes money off that. He it makes money off his books. Mm -hmm. And he puts what he does in the, in the, in the uh, lessons and in those courses into practice. And that's how he makes his money. Now, that separate division that runs SPF, okay, now there, that, that's a profitability center for those folks. It makes money, it pays their salaries. So it's employing people. It's like uh, uh, cover designers. I mean, I, I pay cover designers, I pay editors, I pay a, a formatter, I, all of these folks uh, that that now earn a few nickels off off my books. <clears throat> that's that's the power of uh, of of what we're doing, mm. and so many other people are doing that too. Because look at yourself, uh, you have been now gained a bunch of clients. You help them make more money, and you're making a stable living. Hopefully, your income is it, your base income pays everything you need it to pay. And then, oh, by the way, you're making a little on top of that. Hmm. Well, you know, I, was, I had a, a guy call me up from a private equity company uh, a couple, well, about a month ago. He was just sniffing around, seeing if I had anything going on. And it, clearly, I, when he, and this was a partner at this firm, right? So, like, he, yeah. he's one of these guys you get, like, a 20-minute call. Yeah. Um, he, pr he probably had something there bu they, they're buying or bought that they were thinking about me to run. And I was like, hey, Jonathan, like, I don't have a resume together. I'm like doing this thing with authors and it's really cool and I'm having a blast and I'm not interested in that gig. Yeah. And I, real, I, he, I start telling about what I'm doing and like what's going on in this space. And next thing, it's like 45 minutes. It's like, you yeah. don't get 45 minutes of this guy's time. No, and he's, no. like, well, he's like, how about we have a call next Monday? I want to hear more about this. Right. So, I mean, these guys have over a billion dollars in management. Now, granted, yep. he, the reason he called me was they've got something and one of his underlings called me later to talk about that. But yeah. like the, the, you know, to answer your question, like that's where my head is with this thing is like, I have opportunities I could go after that I'm putting aside because I see this is a, a unique time that I'm never, ever going to get to experience again. This, what I call this golden age of content creation. I think yeah. this is bigger than we all understand. Mm -hmm. And the democratization of content creation is going to have a pro profound impact because it's also aligning with the overall world is getting more educated and having more time for leisure and needs more entertainment. Yep. Right? Yep. Um, so knowing that this is what I want to do. Right. Like I could do other stuff, probably make more money, but I'm doing this. And, you know, Lisa and myself, we have got a nice client base. Um, and, and to our point, like we're figuring things out, right? Like you were talking about your planning. It's like, well, we've learning things with clients that we've taken on. It's like, oh, you know, now we understand that even these successful people don't necessarily fully understand their business. They think they're ready to come work with us but they're not. And I'm, we're not trying to be snobbish, but it's like they almost, um, because they've been so successful, don't understand how fragile the business might be. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you have to be ready to make zero. <laughs> <laughs> um, so helping people, um, you know, and we, you, that's a great thing. Like when I go to 20 books is I'm not out there advertising. Like people come to me because it's like, they ask somebody, why are they successful doing X? And they're like, well, it's because I let Solari go do this for me. Right. <laughs> and we're, 
you know, we're, we're good at what we do. So that, that way we can give them the most important thing that we can give them, their writing time back, right? Yes. And that's, uh, and that's a gift that you don't look at lightly. So uh, uh, being able to write and get those words down because content creation, yeah, I talk an IP, same thing, same concept of, uh, of uh, uh, look at the movies, how many are remakes and stuff like that. You look at uh, Netflix competing with Amazon, competing with, uh, uh, with Hollywood. How do, how do they find the next big winners? And it's not going to magically happen as somebody needs to know somebody and say something nice. But if you don't have your books out there, you can pitch any idea you want. It's not going to go anywhere. But if you've got books upon books upon books who are well-written and go to exactly what they want, you don't, you, that might be the opportunity that you missed by not having those books done, by not having uh, the content out there. Hmm. creating that content and having it available, then you're, you're in the driver's seat, at least when you finally get on that freeway. Yeah, for sure. Well, we've been going over an hour here, so we should probably wrap up. It's been great talking to you again, Craig. Us talking about everything under the sun. Yeah. Uh, you bet. There's, there's so much out there. There's so much to this business. And, and what I don't want people to do is get all bummed about, oh my God, I don't know about any of this stuff. Don't worry about anything except writing your book. Mm -hmm. Once you've written the book, then you can put on a different hat and go look at the other parts of it. You don't want to, because very, very few people embrace the business side of it. Uh, I, I mean, geeky, dweeby folks like uh, Joe and May, that's, we <laughs> love the, the business side, uh, managing the, uh, the process. I mean, process flow, nothing gets sexier than process flow analysis. So, uh, uh, once you get that, that's why my process, I've got everything with redundancies and we don't have, uh, under the theory of constraints, mm -hmm. I, I don't have a single point of failure in my process besides me. And I'm not even that because I've got other people who can write me, kind of like me, if need be. Mm -hmm. So there's some 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 rhythm and uh, uh, rhythm for you. Uh, no single point of failure in my process. Other people, it's okay. A, that you have only one cover designer, that you only have one editor, but the price of that, your insurance policy on that is time. Because uh, if, if that you have a failure there, then you may have to start over on your process mm -hmm. and it could be months delay in your book. Just understand that. And that's part of the business side of it. But you don't need to know any, you, you, you can learn the business as you go, but you, it's uh, no sense learning it if you don't have a book out. Well, that's learn, it. That's uh, it's a uh, and like you kickstarting. Hey, let's kickstart to see how this works. We're going to analyze the hell out of it, and then we're going to share it with people. Yeah, it's going to work for you. Yeah, yeah, and that that's you know the whole purpose of that was to say if if you're a beginning author that doesn't have the kind of cash flow that maybe you have or I have, um, here's a way that you can get into that game and find an audiobook audience. And it, it's twofold. You can get the cash up front and you can start finding people that actually want to listen to audiobooks. Um, so yeah, I, I but to your point, like you gotta have product. Like you can't, you know, you need water, sugar, and lemons if you're gonna open up a lemonade stand. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so you Simple gotta, as that, man. <laughs> it's, Simple as that. It's um and I think that that's where um I see a lot of early authors like they they think there's some magic to it. There's something like, but it's, no, it's a, you, if the, you the, the only the only magic is the book has to be good enough. It doesn't have to be the best book ever, and that also is a paralysis point for a lot of authors. Is that hey, my favorite author Lee Child, I, I've written a thriller, but it's just not as good as his. Well, no shit. I mean, how many how many do you yeah. think he's written? Yeah, uh, it's. And, and that's, don't compare, I heard, I, I saw this yesterday, don't compare your, your beginning to somebody else's middle or end. It, mm. It's, everybody has to start somewhere, and maybe his first effort was better, but it was trad pub and, and different editors. Uh, some people are great writers, and this is one thing we found with, uh, as we've gone out looking for uh, products, uh, properties to license, is uh, some people... They have the best editors in the world, some very, very well-renowned names. 
and, and you look at their raw material and like, oh my God, this is, this is unreadable. <laughs> so, so, uh, yeah, un, under, understand that maybe some people have a different pro their process, their, mm -hmm. their book factory that they've, they put their books into churns out the lemon, the lemonade when their original product was just a lemon mm. and, and understand. So, uh, you're comparing something apples and oranges, uh, uh or, or limes and lemons mm -hmm. or as uh, Yuda from Sri Lanka. Uh, we went out. We went out to dinner this last weekend, and uh, uh, we went to PF Chang's, and they brought him a a rum and coke, and they put they put a lime in it. Uh, he hadn't seen a lime before, so he said, hey, "You put this weird lemon in there. I don't. I I, I don't want this." So, <laughs> so just understand uh, comparing lemons and limes. Yep. Um. The uh, uh, uh good enough. Get some reviews, flex from there, get better next time, and better is relative. Mm -hmm. Only the readers are the final arbiter of whether something's good or not. So, absolutely. And it's no, finding them as readers, right? Like it's, I say this all the time it's writing something you love and finding readers that love to read that. There, there's the magic, right? It doesn't mean it's going to win a Pulitzer Prize or that it's, you know, it's something that you or I would enjoy reading. But if yeah. there's a big enough audience out there, right? Like I still struggle with the idea that people read books about playing video games, but that doesn't they read mean, a lot. <laughs> they they're it's like there's millions of dollars being made in that. So yes. I'm not the target audience. So you yeah. don't yeah. need to make me happy. But you no. made all those other people happy enough to give you cold hard cash. Yeah, for, if they're paying for your book and then want to pay for your next book too. That's a win. Yeah. All right, man. Well, let's wrap it up. And uh, we can always, you know, get back and talk about when you're, maybe when you've got the uh, paper back up and we can get into some specifics of stuff with the book that we can, like, hey, go dig With in. release strategies and then yeah. collaborations is uh, right on its heel. I I'm collecting up uh, uh, some template contracts, and I think that will make the collaborations book worth the price of admission. Great, great. All right, man. Thanks a lot. All right. Talk to you later. Thank you.